Lida Forrest was an American inventor, self-described father of radio, and a pioneer in the development of sound on film recording used for motion pictures. He had over 180 patents, but also a tumultuous career. He boasted that he made, then lost, four fortunes. He was also involved in several major patent lawsuits, spent a substantial part of his income on legal bills, and was even tried for mail fraud. His most famous invention, in 1906, was the three-element grid audio, which, although he had only a limited understanding of how it worked, provided the foundation for the development of vacuum tube technology. Birth and Education Leda Forrest was born in 1873 in Council Bluffs, Iowa, the son of Anna Margaret and Henry Swift de Forrest. He was a direct descendant of Jesse de Forrest, the leader of a group of Walloon Huguenots who fled Europe in the 17th century due to religious persecution. De Forrest's father was a Congregational Church minister who hoped his son would also become a pastor. In 1879 the elder De Forrest became president of the American Missionary Association's Talladega College in Talladega, Alabama, a school open to all of either sex, without regard to sect, race, or color, and which primarily educated African Americans. Many of the local white citizens resented the school and its mission, and Lee spent most of his youth in Talladega isolated from the white community, with several close friends among the black children of the town. De Forest prepared for college by attending Mount Hermon Boys School in Mount Hermon, Massachusetts for two years, beginning in 1891. In 1893, he enrolled in a three-year course of studies at Yale University's Sheffield Scientific School in New Haven, Connecticut, on a $300 per year scholarship that had been established for relatives of David de Forest. Convinced that he was destined to become a famous and rich inventor, and perpetually short of funds, he sought to interest companies with a series of devices and puzzles he created, and expectantly submitted essays in prize competitions, all with little success. After completing his undergraduate studies, in September 1896 De Forest began three years of postgraduate work. However, his electrical experiments had a tendency to blow fuses, causing building-wide blackouts. Even after being warned to be more careful, he managed to douse the lights during an important lecture by Professor Charles Hastings, who responded by having de Forest expelled from Sheffield. With the outbreak of the Spanish-American War in 1898, de Forest enrolled in the Connecticut Volunteer Militia Battery as a bugler, but the war ended and he was mustered out without ever leaving the state. He then completed his studies at Yale's Sloan Physics Laboratory, earning a doctorate in 1899 with a dissertation on the reflection of Hertzian waves from the ends of parallel wires, supervised by theoretical physicist Willard Gibbs. Early radio work De Forest was convinced there was a great future in radio telegraphic communication, but Italian Guglielmo Marconi who received his first patent in 1896, was already making impressive progress in both Europe and the United States. One drawback to Marconi's approach was his use of a coherer as a receiver, which, while providing for permanent records, was also slow, insensitive, and not very reliable. De Forest was determined to devise a better system, including a self-restoring detector that could receive transmissions by ear, thus making it capable of receiving weaker signals and also allowing faster Morse code sending speeds. After making unsuccessful inquiries about employment with Nikola Tesla and Marconi, De Forest struck out on his own. His first job after leaving Yale was with the Western Electric Company's telephone lab in Chicago, Illinois. While there he developed his first receiver, which was based on findings by two German scientists, DRS, A. Neugschwender and Emil Ashkenaz. Their original design consisted of a mirror in which a narrow, moistened slit had been cut through the silvered back. Attaching a battery and telephone receiver, they could hear sound changes in response to radio signal impulses. 
De Forest, along with Ed Smythe, a co-worker who provided financial and technical help, developed variations they called responders. A series of short-term positions followed, including three unproductive months with Professor Johnson's American Wireless Telegraph Company in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and work as an assistant editor of the Western Electrician in Chicago. With radio research his main priority, DeForest next took a night teaching position at the Lewis Institute, which freed him to conduct experiments at the Armour Institute. By 1900, using a spark coil transmitter and his responder receiver, De Forest expanded his transmitting range to about 7 kilometers. Professor Clarence Freeman of the Armour Institute became interested in De Forest's work and developed a new type of spark transmitter. De Forest soon felt that Smythe and Freeman were holding him back. So in the fall of 1901 he made the bold decision to go to New York to compete directly with Marconi in transmitting race results for the international yacht races. Marconi had already made arrangements to provide reports for the Associated Press which he had successfully done for the 1899 contest. De Forest contracted to do the same for the smaller Publishers Press Association. The race effort turned out to be an almost total failure. The Freeman transmitter broke down in a fit of rage. De Forest threw it overboard and had to be replaced by an ordinary spark coil. Even worse, the American Wireless Telephone and Telegraph Company which claimed its ownership of Amos Dolbear's 1886 patent for wireless communication meant it held a monopoly for all wireless communication in the United States, had also set up a powerful transmitter. None of these companies had effective tuning for their transmitters, so only one could transmit at a time without causing mutual interference. Although an attempt was made to have the three systems avoid conflicts by rotating operations over five-minute intervals, the agreement broke down, resulting in chaos as the simultaneous transmissions clashed with each other. De Forest ruefully noted that under these conditions the only successful wireless communication was done by visual semaphore wigwag flags operated a high-powered transmitter that was primarily used to drown out the other two, American De Forest Wireless Telegraph Company. Despite this setback, De Forest remained in the New York City area, in order to raise interest in his ideas and capital to replace the small working companies that had been formed to promote his work thus far. In January, 1902, he met a promoter, Abraham White, who would become De Forest's main sponsor for the next five years. White envisioned bold and expansive plans that enticed the inventor, however, he was also dishonest and much of the new enterprise would be built on wild exaggeration and stock fraud. To back De Forest's efforts, White incorporated the American De Forest Wireless Telegraph Company, with himself as the company's president, and De Forest the scientific director. The company claimed as its goal the development of worldwide wireless. The original responder receiver proved to be too crude to be commercialized, and De Forest struggled to develop a non-infringing device for receiving radio signals. In 1903, Reginald Fessenden demonstrated an electrolytic detector, and De Forest developed a variation, which he called the spade detector, claiming it did not infringe on Fessenden's patents. Fessenden and the U.S. courts did not agree, and court injunctions enjoined American De Forest from using the device. Meanwhile, White set in motion a series of highly visible promotions for American De Forest. Wireless Auto Number 1 was positioned on Wall Street to send stock quotes using an unmuffled spark transmitter to loudly draw the attention of potential investors. In early 1904 two stations were established at Wei Highway on the Chinese mainland and aboard the Chinese steamer SS High Moon, which allowed war correspondent Captain Lionel James of the Times of London to report on the brewing Russo-Japanese War, and later that year a tower, with De Forest, arrayed in lights, was erected on the grounds of the Louisiana Purchase Exposition in St. Louis, Missouri. 
where the company won a gold medal for its radio telegraph demonstrations. The company's most important early contract was the construction, in 1905-1906, of five high-powered radio telegraph stations for the U.S. Navy, located in Panama, Pensacola and Key West, Florida, Guantanamo, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. It also installed shore stations along the Atlantic coast and Great Lakes, and equipped shipboard stations. But the main focus was selling stock at ever more inflated prices, spurred by the construction of promotional inland stations. Most of these inland stations had no practical use and were abandoned once the local stock sales slowed. De Forrester eventually came into conflict with his company's management. His main complaint was the limited support he got for conducting research. While company officials were upset with DeForest's inability to develop a practical receiver free of patent infringement, on November 28, 1906, in exchange for $1,000 and the rights to some early audio and detector patents, DeForest turned in his stock and resigned from the company that bore his name. American DeForest was then reorganized as the United Wireless Telegraph Company and would be the dominant U.S radio communications firm, albeit propped up by massive stock fraud, until its bankruptcy in 1912. Radio Telephone Company De Forest moved quickly to re-establish himself as an independent inventor, working in his own laboratory in the Parker Building in New York City. The Radio Telephone Company was incorporated in order to promote his inventions, with James Dunlop Smith, a former American De Forest salesman, as president, and De Forest the vice president. Arc Radio Telephone Development at the 1904 Louisiana Purchase Exposition, Valdemar Polsen had presented a paper on a new type of transmitter, known as an arc set, which, unlike the discontinuous pulses produced by spark transmitters, created steady, continuous wave signals that could be used for amplitude modulated full audio transmissions. Although Polsen had patented his invention, De Forest claimed to have come up with a variation that allowed him to avoid infringing on Powelson's work. Using his sparkless arc transmitter, De Forest first transmitted audio across a lab room on December 31, 1906, and by February was making experimental transmissions, including music produced by Thaddeus K. Hill's Telharmonium, that were heard throughout the city. On July 18, 1907, De Forest made the first ship to shore transmissions by radio telephone. Race reports for the annual Interlakes Yachting Association regatta held on Lake Erie, which were sent from the steam yacht Thelma to his assistant, Frank E. Butler, located in the Fox's Dock Pavilion on South Base Island. De Forest also interested the U.S. Navy in his radio telephone, which placed a rush order to have 26 arc sets installed for its Great White Fleet around the world voyage that began in late 1907. However, at the conclusion of the circumnavigation the sets were declared to be too unreliable to meet the Navy's needs and removed. The company set up a network of radio telephone stations along the Atlantic coast and the Great Lakes for coastal ship navigation. However, the installations proved unprofitable, and by 1911 the parent company and its subsidiaries were on the brink of bankruptcy. Eugenia Farrar sang, I Love You Truly, in an unpublicized test from his laboratory in 1907, and in 1908, on De Forest's Paris Honeymoon. Musical selections were broadcast from the Eiffel Tower as a part of demonstrations of the ARC transmitter. In early 1909, in what may have been the first public speech by radio, De Forest's mother-in-law, Harriet Stanton Blatch, made a broadcast supporting women's suffrage. More ambitious demonstrations followed. A series of tests in conjunction with the Metropolitan Opera House in New York City were conducted to determine whether it was practical to broadcast. Opera performances live from the stage. Tosca was performed on January 12, 1910, and the next day's test included Italian tenor Enrico Caruso. On February 24, 
The Manhattan Opera Company's MME, Marriott Mazarin Sang, La Habanera, from Carmen over a transmitter located in the Forest Lab. But these tests showed that the idea was not yet technically feasible, and De Forest would not make any additional entertainment broadcasts until late 1916, when more capable vacuum tube equipment became available. Grid Audio and Detector De Forest's most famous invention was the Grid Audio, which was the first successful three element vacuum tube, and the first device which could amplify electrical signals. He traced its inspiration to 1900, when, experimenting with a spark gap transmitter, he briefly thought that the flickering of a nearby gas mantle's flame might be in response to electromagnetic pulses. With further tests he soon determined that the cause of the flame fluctuations actually was due to air pressure changes produced by the loud sound of the spark. Still, he was intrigued by the idea that, properly configured, it might be possible to use a flame or something similar to detect radio signals. After determining that an open flame was too susceptible to ambient air currents, De Forest investigated whether ionized gases, heated and enclosed in a partially evacuated glass tube, could be used instead. In 1905-1906 he developed various configurations of glass tube devices, which he gave the general name of audions. The first audions had only two electrodes, and on October 25, 1906, De Forest filed a patent for diode vacuum tube detector that was granted U.S. Patent number 841387 on January 15, 1907. None of these initial designs worked particularly well. De Forest gave a presentation of his work to date to the October 26, 1906 New York meeting of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers, which was reprinted in two parts in late 1907 in the Scientific American Supplement. He was insistent that a small amount of residual gas was necessary for the tubes to operate properly. However, he also admitted that, I have arrived as yet at no completely satisfactory theory as to the exact means by which the high-frequency oscillations affect so markedly the behavior of an ionized gas. In late 1906, De Forest made a breakthrough when he reconfigured the control electrode, changing it from outside the glass to a zigzag wire inside the tube. Positioned in the center between the cathode filament and the anode plate electrodes, he reportedly called the zigzag control wire a grid due to its similarity to the gridiron lines on American football playing fields. Experiments conducted with his assistant, John V. L. Hogan, convinced him that he had discovered an important new radio detector, and he quickly prepared a patent application which was filed on January 29, 1907, and received U.S. Patent number 879532 on February 18, 1908. Because the grid control audio was the only configuration to become commercially valuable, the earlier versions were forgotten, and the term audio later became synonymous with just the grid type. It later also became known as the triode. The grid audio was the first device to amplify, albeit only slightly, the strength of received radio signals. However, to many observers it appeared that De Forest had done nothing more than add the grid electrode to an existing detector configuration. The Fleming valve, which also consisted of a filament and plate enclosed in an evacuated glass tube, De Forest passionately denied the similarly of the two devices, claiming his invention was a relay that amplified currents while the Fleming valve was merely a rectifier that converted alternating current to direct current. The U.S. courts were not convinced, and ruled that the grid audio did in fact infringe on the Fleming valve patent, now held by Marconi. On the other hand, Marconi admitted that the addition of the third electrode was a patentable improvement and the two sides agreed to license each other so that both could manufacture three electrode tubes in the United States. Because of its limited uses and the great variability in the quality of individual units, 
The grid audio would be rarely used during the first half decade after its invention. In 1908, John V, 